Hello, my name is Thaddeus Ladd. I'm from HRL Laboratories, and I'll be talking about how to put exchange-only gates together. So exchange-only is a modality for qubits that really is beneficial, ironically, because of its simplicity. Uh, if you have an, an exchange-only encoding, you can implement a array of qubits using only DC voltages on transistor-like devices. You don't need magnetic field gradients, RF, lasers, or, or other things that tend to be lower fidelity than the exchange interaction. Uh, and that's very good for scaling. However, it didn't start out that way. Uh, it started out as a decoherence-free subsystem qubit whose main advantage was the reduction of correlated error, which, of course, is very important for fault tolerance. Uh, the real uh, breakthrough for exchange only came about a year after that, that seminal work from Bacon and co-workers from them and David DiVincenzo, where it was shown that you can do a controlled knot gate within these decoherence-free subspaces using only sequential pairwise exchange. Um, and that was published in Nature. Uh, that result required some level of spin polarization. About 10 years later, uh, Brian Fong and Steve Wanzura, working out of HRL, uh, found a, a slightly shorter CNOT sequence, but more important than being shorter, it worked without need for spin polarization. Uh, both of these results were found by computational searching. It was about five years after the Fong and Wanzura result that uh, Zoich and Bonesteel showed how you could understand that fong Wanzura sequence uh, through some, some pulse analytics. That was very inspirational for me, at least. Much more recently, uh, Langrock and DiVincenzo have also found a, a, um, a new reset of leak sequence that's shorter than the one that was in the fong Wanzura paper, uh, which I'll address. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about all this now is that uh, at this conference, we, have, we are showing experimental demonstrations of these pulse sequences. Uh, and see Matt Reed's talk about this, but as a little preview of that talk, uh, the way we do the experimental implementation of this exchange only is with six dots. This is an SEM of six metal circles that uh, define the potential for the underlying semiconductor. Those are contacted via uh, vertical via-like structures that go to this back-end uh, routing uh, connecting to the electronics. Uh, if we zoom into a cross-section of this device uh, with this um, TEM, you can see the... Um, the vias and the dots, and underneath that, the silicon, silicon germanium quantum well, which hosts the electrons. Uh, there are six of them, because three of them make a single qubit. And what the voltages on those gates do is they push those electrons closer to one another. And the more you push them, the stronger this exchange interaction, which swaps or partially swaps spins, really is. And then we make sequences of calibrated uh, exchange interactions, which are uh, shown by one of these braiding diagrams. So let's look at a braiding diagram in more detail. Uh, this is one for a leakage-controlled CZ. Uh, it's 45 pulses long. Each one of the colored boxes is has an angle that's indicated. Pi would be a full spin swap, uh, pi over 2, a square root of swap, etc. What this sequence does is it does a controlled Z gate that prevents the spread of leakage. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about that as well as where every single one of these pulses come from in this talk. I want to start with this primitive of six square root of swap gates. Um, a good way to remember what this sequence is is to imagine four spins arranged in a square, and you do square root of swaps to the two vertical neighbors, the two um, horizontal neighbors, and then the two diagonal anti-diagonal neighbors. Uh, and what these six square root of swaps combine to do is exactly a controlled Z gate between two singlet triplet qubits in their M equals zero subspace. It's impossible to do single qubit operations in that singlet triplet system using exchange only, but it's notable that there is a CZ gate using only the exchange interaction. If you wanted to derive this from scratch, it's very similar to the textbook uh, problem of making a square root of uh, a controlled Z gate from two square root of swap gates. Uh, but of course, it's a, a little bit more complicated than that. I don't have time to go over it, but that's a little hint if you want to try to figure that out on your own. Uh, you can, of course, make this into a linear nearest neighbor layout with uh, by adding pi pulses, uh, as in this diagram. And this basic primitive is going to be important for all the sequences I'll, I'll discuss today, starting with the Fong one zero CZ and this Zoich bone steel construction of it. Um, so the way to see that is instead of thinking of two singlet triplet qubits, 
uh, you can convert to this change of basis using the uh, Raka coefficients into this set of quantum numbers. Uh, this corresponds to one three electron DFS qubit in which the total spin one half of those three, S123, spin one half is the encoded subspace and spin three halves is the leak subspace. Within the encoded subspace, we can look at this uh, aggregate spin one half uh, and ask whether the spin projection M123 is anti-symmetrically or symmetrically aligned with the fourth spin M4 in this encoding. Uh, and that gives total angular momentum zero or one. And what you see is that depending on the state of this three-spin DFS qubit, uh, you will either swap or not swap this M123 and M4 degree of freedom. In that sense, it makes a kind of uh, a spin gauge Fredkin gate. And the zoich bonesteel construction is to take three of these Fredkin-like gates, use those to do these controlled swaps between two spins, four and five. As you can see from this diagram, if the S12 is in its encoded zero state, that is zero, nothing happens. And if it's in its one state, then the uh, aggregate action is a swap between four and five. Uh, and the nice thing about this as a uh, composite pulse sequence is that it doesn't matter what kind of singlet triplet like qubit S45 is. It could be singlet triplet, it could be the three spin DFS, it could be the four spin DFS. It doesn't matter what encoding you use, and it doesn't matter what remaining M quantum numbers you have. It's gauge independent, uh, and that makes it very flexible uh, and very elegant. However, it does have an issue, and that is the fact that the uh, triplet subspaces in these quantum numbers have both ones and minus ones means that this spreads leakage. Uh, it, depending on the state of that 4-5 qubit, you can move the 1-2-3 qubit in and out of leakage spaces. But that's useful. In fact, it's useful for the reset if leak gate. The reset if leak gate works by initializing a singlet on the S4-5 pair, putting it into some superposition state with an X gate and shuffling information around. That compiles into two pulses. Uh, you then do exactly this primitive I've been discussing, and you shuffle back. And the result in a linear nearest neighbor layout is exactly this 15-pole sequence recently published by Langrock and DiVincenzo. Uh, I, I, I found this sequence shortly after Zoich's uh, paper showed me that this primitive existed. Uh, and the fact that uh, a computational search found what's probably the shortest way to do reset if leaked um, and found exactly the same sequences is very encouraging for this uh, method of analysis. Now this um, sequence will be very important for future fault tolerance because it'll allow you to reduce leakage in a system. Um, it still needs experimental tests though. So besides reducing leakage with this sequence, uh, I mentioned earlier this concept of leakage control. That is preventing the spread of leakage. So the reason leakage spread is an issue is if we look at this primitive, it does some control rotation in the encoded subspace. Uh, here I'm looking in the basis of the quantum numbers of five spins. In the leakage subspace of the, of the DFS qubit, what we see is that it also does some sort of uh, pi pulse rotation about some axis uh, Q when, when that S123 qubit is leaked. Uh, and that would ultimately leak a qubit um, elsewhere. Even when you put three of them together, uh, there, there's still some sort of rotation in this, in this um, uh, about some axis in this leak subspace of the DFS qubit. And that would cause a four, five, six qubit to which you're coupling to also become leaked with near unity probability, and that would spread leakage. So the fix to that is to note that that rotation is a pi pulse rotation. It squares to identity. Uh, so if you could do two CZs together, you would uh, eliminate that leakage spreading. Of course, you would also only have an identity gate. But if you intersperse it with Hadamard's, which are single qubit gates and therefore are uh, identity on the leakage subspace of the one, two, three qubit, and then fix up the action with, with some rotations, single qubit rotations, uh, then you can come back to a CZ that gets rid of that leakage spreading. This is what we call a leakage controlled CZ gate. This is going to be very important for fault tolerance to keep leakage from spreading. It doesn't stop leakage. If you have gate error, which you always have at some level, you will still have leakage at the rate of gate errors, but at least it won't spread. So this is the gate sequence that I showed in the early in this talk. Uh, we have now discussed leakage control, and we have shown where all 45 of these pulses come from. They come from some shuffling information, from some single qubit corrections, and from six instances of this very basic singlet triplet CZ primitive, which is great. Now, is this 
The best we can do, is this the shortest sequence that does leakage control and entangles two DFS qubits? No. Um, in fact, here is another leakage control Z sequence on two DFS qubits, which was found by a computer, uh, again by, by Brian Fong and Steve Wanzura. And in this one, it's much shorter. It's, it's 28 pulses instead of about 40. I don't know what all of these pulse angles mean. They're, they're all different. It's just a computer that told me what these were. But the unitary action of these two gates is about the same. Uh, both of these work. Uh, the top one, you can see Matt Reed's talk to see it in experimental action. Which one's better? Obviously, if you had white noise, a shorter sequence is better. If you have quasi-static noise, then it's not obvious which is better. And um, there's a whole analysis there that's a talk for another day. I will say that HRL has found many of these sequences, many variants of entangling leakage-controlled uh, gates, uh, also other kinds of gates, Berkeley gates, iSwap gates, all of the Clifford gates. Uh, there's different ways of mitigating leakage. There's different ways to compensate for known static noise sources for gradients. Uh, it's all very interesting. Maybe of some of them were analytically derived and we understand every pulse, as in this pulse sequence on the top, but many of them are just the output of a computer and there's plenty of juicy theory left to understand them. So if this flavor of theory is of interest to you or the experiments uh, or fabrication or software development surrounding the demonstration of this kind of architecture of quantum computing, Come work with us. We are hiring at HRL. Uh, we have uh, positions open in pretty much every relevant area. See our webpage, quantum.hrl.com, if you're interested in that. And with that, I thank you for your attention.